last week's talk was Mind the Gap, referring to the announcement uh, on the train when you come into the station and there's a gap, a potentially dangerous gap, between the carriage and the platform. And using that just as an image for the gap that Joko Beck so often referred to, the gap between my life as it is, life as it is, and my life as I would want it to be. And that in some way the very core of our practice is just simply the experiencing of this gap, the experience of the resistance of what I want and what's there, what the world presents. And as Chuck always said, you know, me versus the world, who's going to win? And yet, well, let's start with, is it better to say the gap between my life as it is and my life as I would imagine it, or life as it is, life as I would like it to be. You can kind of argue it both ways, I think, and it's a subtle difference, but in a way quite important. No right, no wrong. My life, or me, and then there's a world out there, and we're separate and potentially... <laughs> antagonistic or I say life as it is and then that immediately sounds like it's got a capital L life the force of life continuing and that sounds distant and objective flowing on regardless of me and in a way, neither of those are quite right, because what we really want to get at is this sense that, yeah, life absolutely is bigger than me, but it's still me. Now, as a phrase of Dogen's, in some ways, the founder of our Zen tradition, founder of the Soto school in Japan, one of the great philosophers of, of Zen Buddhism. It's this little line of his, which can be understood in many different ways. To study the self is to forget the self. And that's got a lot to do with what I'm trying to talk about here. And I came across an interesting parallel to that um, in a talk given by Slavoj Žižek, the very well-known contemporary philosopher, he was actually talking about psychoanalysis and he was saying that everybody thinks the aim of psychoanalysis is to understand myself to the point where I don't have any problems anymore. And he was saying that's just got nothing to do with it whatsoever. The point of undertaking an endless procedure like analysis is to get to the point where you just forget about yourself. You just let yourself go. And then you can devote yourself to a cause, to the world. And I thought this, this is an interesting parallel to what Dogen's saying. Another way of saying is, well, I, you know, I just get out the way. And then there is life to be lived. Not some <gasps> abstract life with a capital L, but just life. Our relationship. The world getting on with itself. And if we say with understanding, then maybe we just sit here and wait for enlightenment. But if we say that both our practice and our life and the life of everybody is fundamentally a doing and acting in the world, then maybe that gives us 
a different kind of sense. Because, yeah, acting in the world, we're going to generate resistance. There's going to be friction. That's life. That's how we move through life. And so to come back to this idea of the gap between life as it is, or my life as it is, and life as I would want it to be, that gap is actually the open space within which we have both the freedom to move and to act and to do, and the motivation. There are problems. And the name we give to problems is, in Sanskrit, so we come back to dukkha, suffering, dis-ease, everything, major or minor, that isn't right. But the question is, how are we with these things? And there's a lovely piece of Joko's writing where she's talking about the idea of enlightenment and what an enlightened being's attitude might be. You know, and she says, okay, tomorrow I lose everything and I have to spend the rest of my life as a bag lady carrying around my life in a few plastic bags, sleeping on park benches, suffering all the problems of homelessness. Is that okay? Hmm. If I have an accident and I lose all of my limbs, my hands, my feet, my arms, my legs, is that okay? Am I okay with that? What does okay mean in a case like that? And we might think, ah, yes, mental resilience, the ability to cope, be unperturbed by anything. I mean, there's a chance we sound like the knight in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know, a mere flesh wound, I'll carry on. Um, Yeah, and maybe actually that's the more important thought because... What do we mean by it's okay? And I think we get a different sense of this. And this came up in the discussion last week. Um, What if it's my child? What if they're desperately ill? What if they lose all of their limbs? Is that okay? Is that okay in the same way that I can imagine it being okay for me? Or even my beloved animal companion. If they suffer, is that okay? Well, yeah, but that's, that's them. Uh, hang on. This actually starts to get difficult, doesn't it? Because either I'm a callous so-and-so. Ha! Huh, what do I care about that? Some kind of weird thing. Not caring about my child, whoever or I have some wonderful idea of equanimity and being unperturbed by things, or, no, I really do care. It's not okay. It's not okay at all. This, I think, is where Barry, Joko's student, my teacher, Barry's saying, begins to tell. It's not a problem to have problems. And in a way, this being a major part of the fruit of our practice, just this, in however far we find it, this un, this experiencing that it's okay to have problems. It's not a problem to have problems. What do we actually mean by this? Well, it's, it's a few years ago now, maybe four or five years ago. Um, his family pet, which they'd had since, I think, even before his son was born, you know, and his son was at college at this point. Um, 
died. Not the son, the dog, Solo the dog. Um, and he was distraught. He was wrecked by this. And rather than putting on a brave face or a, well, he's American, so it's not going to put on a stiff upper lip, but rather than this image of equanimity, modeling, expressing, showing us the extent of his grief at this loss, his experiencing of this loss, his experiencing of the actual emotion of this problem, this dukkha, this suffering. Because to feel this resistance to life, and that's, you know, that's a big example of our resistance to life. Life takes from us. Buddha says this in the Four Noble Truths. We don't like it. So in what sense is that? Okay. So we could rephrase what Barry is saying just by saying, it's okay for it not to be okay. It's not a problem to have problems if I can actually experience that because the problem the problems become a problem when I push that experience away when I try and deny it or I just collapse under the weight of it through repetitive storytelling catastrophizing fantasizing about the future how dreadful it's going to be, or whatever. But I turned the reality of this problem into something else. That I use it as a way of cutting off from the world, cutting off from other people, cutting off from my own feelings, my own actual thoughts. So the sickness of my child is never going to be good. But is it a spur? Is it a stimulus to do whatever is needed? Is it yet another demonstration of the depth of feeling, the depth of connection, the centrality of this to the experience of my life? Or is it a problem? that it's a problem, because it is a problem. And when you have a problem, you do something about it. Sometimes all we can do is hold the grief, hold the pain. Sometimes there are things to be done. And again, is our experiencing of this gap going to allow us to move to live, to experience, and to act in the world, to do my life as doing? Or am I going to see it as a, a failure, a fault, a block? This is important because this is one of the really important ways in which I can connect with myself, but I can actually connect with other people with the world, with society. Because we do have problems. And while Joko tended to talk, and even maybe to a large extent Barry often does about them as, you know, my personal problems. If I'm a woman out in public space, on the dance floor, is it a problem if I'm groped? Is it a problem if I'm walking down the street and I get catcalled? Is it a problem if I don't go down that road at night because I'm afraid I might be assaulted? Damn right it's a problem. We need to recognise that. We need to feel that. We all need to experience that as a problem. 
a few years ago, I got stopped by the police because the rear light in my car I was driving was out. They were very nice. Talk to me. Go and show your license at the police station. End of. A lot of places in the States. If I was driving and my taillight was out and I didn't know and I was black. Lying on the floor, searched, possibly beaten, possibly killed. We know a lot of murders involving the police actually begin just in traffic stops. Is that a problem? Damn right it's a problem. It needs, it needs to be addressed. How do we address it? It's different for all of us, obviously. Worth here remembering just the original meaning of woke. Woke as the strategies, intellectual, emotional responses that I need as a, a black man to, or a black woman to survive in this specific environment where I find myself what I can do, what I can't do, and the range of issues that that involves and how you might address those, how you might change those. So it's not random espousal of values, it's very practical awareness and how we relate to other people in the world. And of course, if we were to translate woke into Sanskrit, unusually, because, you know, we've talked about dukkha, we endlessly come up with different words, stress, suffering. Woke translates perfectly into Sanskrit. It translates as Buddha, the awakened one. Well, actually, just woke, that's what it actually means. And I mention this because I've had a few conversations recently around Juneteenth, which is tomorrow which is why I mention it today. Um, celebration, the public holiday connected with the final ending of slavery in the United States, ending more or less anyway. And that's the point in a sense, uh, a freeing that for many wasn't really a freeing and for many more after the early optimism and gains of the Reconstruction era collapsed into the organised and thoroughgoing racism that we now refer to as the Jim Crow era. And I mention this because of its connection with another way of talking around the world, which is the prophetic Christian tradition and very often you know, we mention Christianity, oh, we're not like that. No, no, they do it like that, but we do it like this, and that's the important difference. Um, but I'm not going to say that here, because this prophetic tradition that comes out of that Old Testament Jewish experience of exile, and then the exodus and the the promise of the promised land and the moving into the promised land, and then the loss and renewed exile spoke very strongly to the black experience in the United States, and that finds its way through into the civil rights movement, into, of course, Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech. And I mention this because are we going to try in whatever way to work with these problems that aren't just my problem, but are problems and they affect me and they affect you always in different ways, but they're certainly a problem. So can our practice help bring us to this place where we recognize the fully problematic nature of these problems 
and at the same hold them in a way that it's not a problem, that these are problems. Another image of Joko's, just this little saying, ABC, a bigger container, that through our practice we become literally more able to contain. Or, or we might actually say experience. You see, if I don't dissociate from, if I don't back away from, if I don't turn away from, if I don't zone out of my own experience, the bits I don't like, the pain, the suffering, the anger, the outrage, if I allow these things to be, but I don't get carried off on anger. I don't get carried off on rage. I don't collapse into depression. I don't collapse into despair. And if we care, and if we don't care, what on earth is the point of us? But if we care, all of these things are difficult. All of these things are problems. They're very real. But our practice offers us a space for a different vision, a different vision of our place in the world and of our relationships in the world. Ours, the big sense, not just mine, ours collectively. Some of the work we've done on the ninth precept and there's a Dharma talk, which I think is called Anger, my teacher, and there's the commentary. Talk about anger as my teacher, the actual experiencing. What can I learn from this? How can I grow through this? It's possible. It's never easy, but it's possible. Just coming back to this Christian tradition for a moment, there's a lovely lyric um, show my age now. The uh, hip hop group Arrested Development, fishing for religion. It's a, the word cope and the word change is the opposite, not the same. And it's talking about that Baptist tradition of, well, it'll all be fine when you get to the pearly gates. Don't worry now. Just bear with. It'll all be fine by and by. And isn't this actually a bit like the way we can use enlightenment? The idea that, oh yeah, well that's over there and I can see that it, you know, it would be. Doesn't matter whether it's after death or after my enlightenment. No, we're here now. Coping is not what it's about. This idea of a bigger container is not about coping. It's about holding, it's about experiencing, and it's about action, whatever that action is. And the action that takes us in the direction of realising ourselves as each other, in each other, as not separate. Not sealed off from each other, but it related to each other. Life as it is. My life as our life as it is. Perhaps that's a good way of saying it. That a gap between our life as it is and our life as we might want it to be. Does that tear us apart from ourselves? Tear us apart from each other? Or is that gap the space through which we can enter to enrich our own and each other's lives. <laughs>